today, we're mailing deals every day to approximately two and a half million people. You've figured out how to utilize data and how to build lists and really leverage all these juicy little nuggets of information that a company has. We believe to the bottom of our soul that today a marketer needs to own their own data. The difference between a service provider and a real marketer is the difference between the Mona Lisa and a faded Xerox of the Mona Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome everybody, I'm your host Chuck Fetterly and you are listening to Media in the Moment. In today's episode, we're discussing an old medium, email marketing. Yes, I know, email marketing, it's been around forever. What else is there to know? Well, in today's episode, I get to speak with Jafar Ali, who's the president of PulseTV.com. This is a really interesting e-commerce direct-to-consumer company who sends out over 2 million emails every day. So, if there's somebody that knows how to do email marketing, it's Joffer and his team. I think you'll find this discussion interesting because we take a new look at email marketing through the lens of someone who's been practicing it for over 20 years. Let's jump into the episode. Well, hello, Joffer. Welcome to the podcast. I'm glad we could finally make this interview happen because you, my friend, dare I say, are a legend in the direct marketing world. Well, it's an honor to be here, and I appreciate knowing you for all these years. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Well, before we dive in, can you share a little bit about your yourself, your, your work history, and where you started and where you are today? Well, we've been in the direct-to-consumer business for approximately 40 years. Wow. I worked in the family home video business, and we owned the rights to the Beatles, A Hard Day's Night on video, and I had this idea that we could do direct response with the Beatles, which never had been done on TV, just to promote the idea that it was coming out on video. It wasn't successful on a direct marketing basis, but it was tremendous letting everybody know that, hey, they could see a hard day's night on home video. I left the family business to create a direct-to-consumer uh, video catalog and I sold that business in 1996. And my non-compete disallowed any catalog business or magazine business selling any product. So we went back to TV, direct to consumer, short form commercials. Some of the success was Riverdance, Lord of the Dance, uh, Muhammad Ali, Skilled Brains and Guts. And then about 25 that we really lost an awful lot of money on. <laughs> <laughs> and that drove us off television back in 1998 at the end. Right. And it drove us to where there was a huge pool of unsold advertising inventory on the Internet. Yeah. And we've been exclusively on the Internet since 1998. Right. So, so that's the brief of it. Huh. I discovered email marketing as probably the most you know advantageous of all that m advertising media online. Absolutely, which is why we're here today. For our loyal listeners are, are discussing email marketing. One of the oldest forms of digital marketing, you know, there is, frankly, when you think about the history of, of the internet. But a lot has been written on the subject of email marketing. There's no shortage of content. You can find, you know, how to do email, what to do, what not to do. I thought, you know, looking at it from your experience, because you do send out a lot of emails that you would bring some fresh perspective. So you just said, I think it was in 1998, you transitioned from largely a ERTV company, right? Selling direct to consumer. Amazon's launched in 94. So now you're seeing that. And you're like, this is all going online, right? I've, I've got to get out of this this TV game. You move online. I would say today, like I, I look at you guys, I think you're like a mini Amazon.com. Is that a fair analogy? Well, we're kind of like a cross between a catalog company yeah. and a, a TV direct response company because we create our own videos online. They're not the yell and sell videos of 
TV direct response. They're more show and tell right. videos, kind of like QVC or HSN vignettes. It's hard to yell and sell when you're 18 inches away from the screen. <laughs> and now you're eight inches away from the telephone, from the mobile phone. So you can't get overly hyped up right. and yell at the people like they are across the room. Yeah. So we don't have hundreds of millions of SKUs. We have approximately 500 SKUs that rotate right. and we buy discounted items. A lot of them are as seen on TV products because I know a lot of the infomercial marketers and TV DR people, and when they're at the end of a life cycle, right? Okay, we buy them on pennies on the dollar, and then we offer them generally online for about fifty percent of retail. No, they're terrific deals, which leads me to my next question. You created, I think it's still around, right? The deal of the day. Could you let us know kind of what that is? I mean, it sounds self-explanatory, but what it is and how many people today receive that via email? Okay. We started the deal of the day before Groupon existed. We were the first company to deliver a deal of the day via email. There was a company called Woot, W-O-O-T, yep. that you had to go to their website and they changed the deal on the website. But my sister, who's my business partner, we had a content newsletter called Get Your Freebies, and we started the deal of the day to that list of 35,000 people. Today, we're mailing deals every day to approximately two and a half million people wow. receiving the new deal every single day. Now, it could be a different deal to different segments, but two and a half million people are getting a deal of the day. That's incredible. With our own small company here, we send out a fair amount of emails each week. It was all about list, right? You had to have a good list. You have figured out, you know, through our conversations over the years, which I really admire you for, is that you've figured out how to utilize data and how to build lists and really leverage all these juicy little nuggets of information that a company has such as yours, correct? Right. Absolutely correct. We believe to the bottom of our souls that today a marketer needs to own their own data. Okay. I used to say own your own media, but people didn't exactly know what media was. But data is media. Mm -hmm. Data is waiting to be deployed. Okay. If you don't deploy it, it sits there like potential energy, like a boulder on a hill. Mm -hmm. Okay, but to own your own data, okay, in 2017, data became the most valuable commodity in the world. It passed oil, okay, in 2017, according to Economist magazine. And so if you think about the most valuable companies online, or maybe in the world, you've got Apple, you've got Amazon, you've got Google, uh, Facebook, and what gives them value is that they own this data. And they guard that data jealously and hold it close to their vest because when you advertise with them and you get a click from Google or Facebook, who owns that click data? Uh -huh. Think about that for a minute. You pay for that click data. It could be three dollars a click if you know if you're right. selling CBD. It could be a dollar a click, you know, for if you're selling a flashlight. But you don't own that data. Google, Facebook, they do. And what do they do with that data? They will market that profile that is enhanced by the money that you pay for that data. They sell it sell back to, to you. Your <laughs> not just sell it back to you, but they will sell it to your competitors. Exactly. So we said, wait a second, there's something inherently right. messed up that's been a complete mind mess Yep. I, I, I won't uh, use a vulgarity Okay, <laughs> from the beginning of the online marketing. And we said, wait a second, we want to own our own data. And it gives us the idea of we own our own media. And when you do, you lower your marginal cost of marketing. Yep. Think about this. When your marginal cost of marketing go close to zero, 
you don't have to be very good at all the other parts of the equation. Right. All right. Every campaign in the world since the caveman tried to sell a fire stick, okay, there's three components. You've got your creative. Yep. You've got your offer. And the offer is the product plus the price. And then you've got your media. And media keeps evolving. Media in the 18th century was different than media in the 19th century, 20th century, 21st century. And so data, the first thing is once you understand that data, if you own it, you can lower your marginal cost and your creative and your offer, you can obviously test them, but you're not going to go broke. You know, you can keep your hook in the water till you find something that really works. Indeed. I mean, we've been preaching this, my goodness, for the last several years to everybody that they have to get their data, their first party data in order. Correct. And I was talking to a, a small firm several months back and, you know, they didn't have even a CRM set up. They weren't capturing any of this. It was in somebody's email accounts spread across the office, right? It was just, it's like, no, to compete and to win in today's environment. I mean, I think this is an absolute must. And there's many different ways to garner first party data. But a lot of the online marketers, they're stuck in a paradigm that is not in their best interest. So right. what we did was we have email newsletters for one. We write the content and we have advertising our own. We also sell advertising, but we then can send solo Pulse TV offers, our e-commerce offers to those subscribers. And so we have just about 900,000 opt-in subscribers to various newsletters, Daily Recipe, Laugh-A-Day, Conservative Review, Progressive Reviews. They're not taking a political stance. If people are interested in conservative topics, they get that. If they're interested in progressive, they get that. So we have 15 different newsletters that we create content. Most recent is all about Bitcoin. Okay. Right, right. Oh, I'm sure it'll continue to grow that list. You're segmenting your lists, right? Somehow saying these people are interested in this type of content. How are you building lists to begin with? Is it just taking people who have purchased from you? Are you buying lists? We always hear you can buy lists. I'm not a proponent of that, but. No, no, we, we never buy any list. Okay. We use surfing behavior that we identify the people mm -hmm. who are visiting. And then, so if we have a website on Bizarre News, mm -hmm. okay, the visitors that visit there, we can identify who is visiting. Okay. And then we match that to a huge email database that we've been accumulating for the last eight years. And that got right around 880 million email addresses. It's 20% of all the email that has ever been issued in the United States. Right. But another way that we build our first party data is that we capture all click data. So if you click on a kitchen gadget item, okay, you have then raised your hand that, hey, you're interested in kitchen products. Right. And on the other hand, if you are a, already a subscriber to the daily recipe and you click on an electronic offer, you can be in multiple categories sure. based upon your behavior sure. and it's so our database gets richer and stronger with every click that's incredible when you send out two and a half million emails a day i cringe when i have a few people unsubscribe or opt out i don't need exact numbers but i mean is it something that obviously you're concerned with Do you guys track that is it something that just happens on every send yeah we get at least one percent attrition unsubscribe with it but we have a way of reinvigorating yep. that but sure. a, f a fascinating thing our lowest attrition rate is our most active list and those are our vip and the average vip subscriber to our pulse tv deals is getting 18 emails a week and the attrition rate is a quarter of a percent per week 
So these are the most loyal and they're getting so much email. But I would say that marketers are not emailing their best customers often enough. Really? Yes. But that's the key word, their best customers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Correct. And I think and that's another way to segment it, right? You, absolutely. You, we've experienced that. The people that do the most with us don't mind hearing from us several times a week. That's correct. You just have to identify those hyperactive subscribers or buyers. They've done studies that 7% of the internet population account for approximately 70% of all clicks. Wow. So you've got a lot of people are ignoring banners, ignoring emails, ignoring things, but identify those 7% that are the most active and you better start deploying to them as much, almost as much until they, you reach the uncle point. <laughs> okay. Exactly. <laughs> All right. And then no is, uh, uh, yeah, and, and marketers are afraid to find that uncle point. And over time, we found it. Yeah. There was a scientist who started adding sugar to ketchup, to all these different products. And his nickname was Dr. Sweet. <laughs> and he found out that for each extra amount of sugar that he added, people liked it more and more up until a certain point. <laughs> and then they fell off the cliff. Right. Every marketer needs to be Dr. Sweet and find <laughs> and find where that cliff is. Okay. I love it. I love it. That's certainly something that everybody needs to do and to learn, right? What's that tipping point before it backfires? Is there anything else you could impart on somebody who's getting into this and wants to take email marketing more seriously? From a creative standpoint, from a list standpoint, from a ESP standpoint. There's a lot to unpack with the question. Yeah. Okay. I will first tell you that we are our own ESP, our own email service provider. And we've used ESPs. We've used many of them. And I think they're the most overpaid sector in the industry. They don't really offer a, a very good service. They don't follow the can spam laws. They have their own rules of best practices. Mm. Following best practice is really a nice overall mantra but it is the surest path to mediocrity. Right. If you want to learn email marketing, you have to do it and make mistakes and you're going to make a lot of them. Yep. I mean, we went through back in 2002, our spam phase. This is prior to the canned spam. Right. And as a matter of fact, our company was called the seventh largest spammer in the world. <laughs> I mean, what a, what a dubious distinction. Yeah, what a great title. Right, right. Yeah, being the seventh biggest spam king in the world. Right? But we learned, uh, we took our lumps, but we understood this is prior to the can spam federal law that came in in 2003. But a lot of the email experts are not real marketers, by the way. They're service providers. Right. And the difference between a service provider and a real marketer is the difference between the Mona Lisa and a faded Xerox of the Mona Lisa. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's good. That's very true. Okay. All right. So when you want to take advice from somebody, first of all, see if they've got the real skin in the game. Is it their money that they're risking Whereas a lot of the ESPs, they're not risking their money. They don't live or die with a campaign being successful or not. I was the director of an email. It was a discussion group that became the largest experts of email called Only Influencers. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of smart people. I was a founding director and I got canceled. I got kicked off about a year ago. Because I took issue with MailChimp, which yeah. is the largest email service provider, was censoring newsletters 
for content. Wow. And it was political content. Right. Okay. I am not, by the way, I am not a Trump supporter. Never voted for Trump, not a big Trump supporter. But they censored Trump, just like Twitter censored Trump. I was just going to say, like the social media channels started doing, yeah. Right. And when the ESPs start doing that, I was very vocal and MailChimp was a sponsor of the only influencers. And <laughs> not and, anymore. And, and, yeah. And I got kicked off <laughs> off the list. <laughs> but wow. You have to be very wary of expert. There's something called the expert problem. Yeah. And you know, so find some experts that really have their own skin in the game and they practice what they preach. Right. That is my suggestion to email newbies. Obviously, we have our own email software, but we went through the pain of trying to use email service providers, but we quickly iterated and we have our own software. Can we dive in that just a little bit? Because that is, I'm a guy, I love building my own stuff. You know me, I've built my own media planning and buying system over the last 20 years. I love tech and I love to own it and improve it and make it mine. How does one go about building their own ESP, if you will? Right. I will tell you how we did it. We mm -hmm. first licensed email software. Okay. And then we hired three Ukrainian yep. software developers who followed the functionality that we wanted. Now we were already, it's not really practical if you're just starting out and you're not doing a lot of email because your upfront cost of development, you know, probably costs us about $50,000 Sure. when we started. Now that was a lot of money for people living in the Ukraine at the time. And this is way before the war. We used as our guidepost, the software that we had licensed. Sure. That time was called Lyris, L-Y-R-I-S. And so we, now we own our own. And because of that, our marginal costs are so low. It's to send two million or two million and one is the, that extra one is zero. Right. It doesn't cost anymore. Just I, like I to serve that. a banner. Right. Love that. There is some open source email software, by the way, which is free, but then you do need an IT department. Yeah, There is open source sure. software that you can get. If we could talk for an hour just on doing that. I mean, that's just fascinating to me. You mentioned can spam before, and I did want to touch on that. This was a, a law that set rules, right, basically for email, and it established requirements for messaging and gave recipients the right to opt out. I mean, that's kind of it in a nutshell. There's probably some more things that were part of it. What did you learn from the whole, you know, because you lived it. You were doing email before. They come in with a new act in 2003. Was there any memories of things that you learned and you were still applying today, other than obviously being, <laughs> you know, compliant? Right. I, I would say that the can spam uh, act in 2003, they're really the two main takeaways are that it's not permission-based. It is really about giving the option that somebody can opt out. The second thing is that the can spam forbids you from scraping data off of the internet. Okay, you're not allowed to invade that privacy to do that. The more recent are the California Privacy Protection Act that they need to agree to receiving. They're trying to add another layer of permission. But what we learned is that the ISPs, the internet service providers, Gmail, Yahoo, Comcast, those where the consumers have their own, they have algorithms. And the algorithms will measure engagement. How many times are people opening? How many times are people clicking? How many times are they clicking to a website and spending time so that it's not a bot click? 
based upon the algorithms which they keep secret, they will you'll inbox. Inboxing is that, so it's not going into your spam filter. It's going into your regular. They will governor how many will be seen in your regular inbox. So that is now another reason why you want content. Okay. You would want content because people presumably, if they're getting a newsletter twice a week, they are more likely to open and to click. Yeah. So that's what we've learned and it's, and it's a balancing act. Absolutely. Absolutely. What, what are the metrics that you guys look at? Is it the traditional stuff that all of us email marketers look at? Yeah, open I mean, rates and anything? Well, open rates we used to, but it's no longer reliable due to Apple and yep. <laughs> have eliminated cookies and Google is in some time this year going to eliminate it. So you really can't even know what the open rate is any longer. And as we get more and more into mobile, okay, becomes, you know, real problematic because when you power down your iPhone or Android, you eliminate all the cookies and so you really are not going to know what the, you know, over 50% of traffic is mobile now. So, right. but click, we measure the click, which is some kind of engagement. And then of course, the conversion rate, we license software that measures all the conversion. So yeah. we know how much money we spend and how many clicks and visitors in essence to the site. I'm glad you mentioned open rate because we experienced just that phenomena years ago or whenever, whenever it happened when our open rates went through the roof and we were like, wow, what's happening? We called our ESP and I won't mention them, but we called them. They couldn't explain it, but a simple Google search told you <laughs> this is what was happening. And it had a lot to do with Apple and everything else. They could have told you they didn't yeah. want to. Yeah, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> exactly. Let me ask you this and maybe we can wrap it up with this question. You had mentioned an organization that you were kicked off of, but it yeah. sounded very interesting. Where would somebody go who maybe has dabbled in email and wants to get better or maybe thinks they're a professional and they just want their master's degree in email marketing? Is there an organization or two that you would recommend that somebody get involved with? It's free. I would, even though I got kicked off, <laughs> I would <laughs> highly recommend onlyinfluencers.com. It's free for the email marketers. Go to Media Post and they have the Email Insider. Yep. Okay. That's a good one. Uh, and I would say the best way to learn is to do. Is to do. Okay. And really pay attention to, to your metrics. And we really use standard direct marketing metrics right. you know, for ourselves. And we recommend that but once you own again i'm banging this drum own your own data first party data first party data exactly your visitors if you can identify your visitors i did not want to make this sound like a plug but for our newsletters for example we became the first platform advertising platform that if you advertise and you're paying either per click or cpm you can purchase the click data because these people are visiting your site. You're paying for the click. And for an additional fee, you can own that data for as long as you want. Nice. As long as somebody stays subscribed. And you'll get the name, address, city, state, and zip, email address. And these people will know you because they are on your website. They exactly. Click to your website. Well, folks, you just heard it. There's the offer. This has been great. I really appreciate this, my friend. And I know we could go on for probably another hour or two, you know, talking about this stuff because we've kind of grown up together in this wacky business and a lot's changed for the last decade or so. You're still going strong. You got a hell of a company. I admire you. I thank you for your time today. And by the way, anytime you want another time together, we can talk about how to use video. Ah, it's really a pretty good topic. That would be a great topic. <laughs> I might take you up on that. All right, anytime. Pleasure being with you, Chuck. Good luck with your podcast. Once again, that was Jaffer Ali, president of PulseTV.com. 
I'm your host, Chuck Fetterly, and you've been listening to Media in the Moment, the agency podcast of TEC Direct Media, a Chicago-based media agency who works with other agencies, emerging brands, and artists from across the U.S. Learn more online at tec-direct.com. Thanks again for listening.